Okay, thank you. So, yeah, I sent you the latest notes a few minutes ago, so you can check the latest one if you want. But uh, basically, today I think, unfortunately, I cannot go to section three yet. So, although I put a little bit of material in section three, probably today uh, sec uh, uh, contents up to section two would be enough. But I slightly changed the uh, the order and so on from the notes yesterday. But anyway, so let's start. So for the last two days, we focused on basically single uh, model called TASIF and uh, <coughs> I explained to you how we can kind of solve this model to study the quantity we are interested in, for example, the current distribution of the integrated current for this model, right? <coughs> and uh, the methods are, so yeah, we studied beta and that. So this is very, very uh, robust and useful method if it works. As I said, this, this method works only for the case of so-called integral systems. And uh, usually, for models at hand, if you try to apply, this does not work. But if it applies, this is really a powerful method. And uh, of course, if you're interested in some specific models, which are known to be integrable, this, this gives you a very powerful method. So now you know this, so you can, <laughs> you can apply it to many models to study various quantities. Right, but uh, today I would like to explain more kind of general aspect of, of, of the integrability for these models, not only for TSA, but for other models as well. So first, introduce, I introduce some models. Basically, they are uh, generalization of TSA. And uh, then I explain kind of standard machinery of integral systems, quantum integral systems, in fact. Right. <coughs> so, I heard that maybe I should write a bit, a bit bigger. So if you don't see the character, please let me know. I tend to become a bit small sometimes. Okay. So as a generalization of TASIF, we already know one model, so ASIF. Right? So in the case, each particle hops in both directions. This is ASIF, and this is generalization of TASIF. But there's uh, another direction of generalization, which has to that is very, very important in this, uh, in this field. So this is Q-TASIF. So this is a version of TASIF, which means that the particles hop only in one direction. So T means totally, right? So totally asymmetric means particles hop only in one direction. So this is, in that sense, this is TASIF. What is the difference from the standard TASIF we know already? The difference is that uh, hopping, hopping rate of each particle. In the standard taste set, each particle hops only to the right neighboring side with, with always rate one. Of course, this particle cannot hop because of the exclusion rule. And in the Q taste set, so this exclusion interaction is the same. So this is passive, but the hopping rate becomes different. And uh, now the hopping rate depends on the distance to the particle ahead. So in this case, there are, so this distance is two, right? So in this case, the hopping rate is given Q to the power Q squared. And in, in more general, if the distance to the particle ahead. Distance uh, or maybe the gap, so empty size between the two particles is n. The hopping rate is given by one minus q to the power n. So basically we should take q between zero and one. And in this case, this is one minus q, right? Otherwise, uh, it's the same as the TASIF. So this is the q TASIF. 
Uh, for example, we can rescale time and uh, divide this rate by one minus Q. So then this becomes one, this becomes one minus Q to the power n divided by one, one minus Q. Then we can consider also Q bigger than one case, and also one can consider Q goes to one limit. Q goes to one limit is very special because uh, in this case, the hopping rate uh, is, uh, becomes n, and this is kind of related, ah, sorry, <laughs> uh, yeah, this uh, is a little bit special, but uh, maybe i explain a bit later. Okay, so this is Q-tasive, and uh, well, this is exclusion process, but uh, there's another way of looking at the same dynamics by focusing on the dynamics of the distances, gaps. So for example, in this case, Maybe we can, <coughs> focus on the gaps, and uh, depending on the gaps among particles, we put particles on each side. And then, if these particles hops to the right, then it means that, uh, yeah, so these particles hop to the left, then yeah, after hopping this, the distance gap becomes just one, right? So this corresponds to the fact that these two particles becomes one particle after the hop. Then we have three, three particles here. This corresponds to the fact that after the hopping, oh, sorry, so there, <laughs> there are now three gaps. Uh, anyway, so if we consider the dynamics of the gaps, or q tensive, there's another process, and because in this case, hopping of particle depends only on the number of particles at each side. In this sense, this is called zero-range process. In the zero-range process, we can also consider hopping in both directions, but uh, in this particular case, particles hop only in one direction, so in that sense, we are considering totally asymmetric zero-range process. And because this is coming from q tensive, we sometimes call this q zero. Difficult to pronounce, but anyway, <clears throat> yeah. So this is one generalization of tensive. But this is still in continuous time. But uh, there are discrete time versions. Uh, one is Bernoulli type. And the other one is geometric type. And I, yeah, but I think uh, if I start explaining, then maybe I cannot explain the main content. So, so this is written in the la last updated note. So please take a look if you are interested. Anyway, there are discrete time versions, at least uh, two versions of it. Right, there's a further generalization which is also important somehow in the theories, which is called Q-Han passive and also corresponding Taza. And this is a discrete time Markov process. Uh, so up to this point, we are considering hopping only to the right, right neighboring side. But for this Q-Han process, we consider hopping to, you know, not only the nearest neighbor, but to some position before the particle ahead. So and the, the hopping probability, which describes this hopping, is described by some function phi, which is written in the note. This is a bit complicated. But I, I don't think I don't write it down. But uh, in, in, yeah, this is written in terms of some Q not Q Q factorial. Uh, this looks a bit compli complicated, but uh, in this theory, this is a little a somewhat important case. Anyway, so this is there's another process called Q Han tensor, and also corresponding zero end process. Right. <laughs> Uh, 
there are other related models, especially in this lecture, probably I don't explain much about the uh, like polymer picture. So even though we are considering, so for the moment, uh, in this lecture, we are basically considering only transport models, hopping models, and also surface growth model. But there's another connection to pro, uh, another problem, which is uh, statistical physics of directed polymer, which is a polymer which, run, which goes in only in one direction in random media. And uh, there are several versions of such a directed polymer problem. Uh, for example, semi-discrete semi -discrete directed polymer by O'Connell and Yo, or log gamma polymer uh, introduced by Separini. And uh, Nikos, sitting over there, is an expert of the, on the log, such polymer. But today you are talking about different things, right? Yeah. But anyway, <laughs> there's an expert on such things too. Yeah, but uh, in these lectures, uh, I don't go to such models. But yeah, but there are some other models too. Okay. Right. Then, next I want to explain Vertex model. <clears throat> so basically, first we want to introduce the so-called six vertex model, and then want to, I want to, to introduce some generalization of it, especially the so-called highest stochastic version of higher spin six vertex model. So first, I start from this vertex model. Uh, maybe this is this small enough? Too small? So I start from a very, very basic thing about the equilibrium statistical mechanics. Are there somebody who does not? who has not learned equilibrium statistical mechanics. All people are there are still some, okay. <laughs> so this is about uh, equilibrium behavior of a material, basically. And uh, <coughs> there are microscopic description of such objects, which allows us to study basically macroscopic behavior. And uh, in this theory, one of the most important objects is a so-called partition function denoted here by z, because this is also related to normalization of a measure, uh, which is a sum of uh, this object here. Ec is the uh, energy of the system for a given configuration of the system. Maybe the simplest example would be Easing, easing model, in which case we have spins, up or down spins at each side, and uh, the energy is given depending on this configuration, microscopic configuration of spins. Right? So for each configura spin configuration of a system, we associate some energy, and this is appearing here. And beta is given by one over KBT. So KB is just some constant called Boltzmann constant. And T is the temperature. Both of them are basically positive. We could consider T equals zero, but are basically positive. And then we put them on this exponent, exponential, and then take a sum of a configuration. So we are thinking that there is a weight for each configuration C given by this e to the power minus beta e. And uh, in that sense, so this is a normalization because we are taking sum of, uh, sum of weights for each configuration over all possible configurations, right? <coughs> and then the central quantity in equilibrium statistical mechanics or thermodynamics is the so-called free energy from which one can compute basically all 
uh, macroscopic quantities, average quantities, and uh, this is given by minus kBT times log Z. So we want so we want to compute Z and take a log basically, but. Uh, <sighs> To be more specific, it is usually useful to consider free energy per unit volume. So maybe for simplicity, maybe we consider simply two-dimensional square lattice with periodic boundary conditions. And the system size in this direction is L, and in this direction is L prime. Then we divide this by one over L, uh, divided by L, L prime, and take limit. Infinity, right? Uh, sorry. So this is called, called the thermodynamic limit. So this is the quantity we want to study in equilibrium statics mechanics, okay? This is really general uh, <laughs> principle in equilibrium statistical mechanics. But then vertex model is a kind of special case of such uh, thing. And now we put, uh, again we consider two dimensional square lattice. But now we are considering a situation in which we put some weight on each vertex, we put some weight. For the case of the Ising model, there are spins on each side, and in a sense, energy is associated with these edges. But in the vertex model, it's kind of different, the opposite. We put some values, some kind of spin variables on each edges, on each edge, and then we put some weight at each vertex or side, depending on these four values of the edges. Right? So this is the vertex model. And, uh, so for the moment, we are considering a rather general situation in which values at each edge can take uh, arbitrary values in some sense. And these values are denoted by L, L prime, J, K for on these four edges. And we write this as a matrix. And the weight is denoted by R. And because depending on these values on edges, or this vertex we are interested in, uh, this can be considered as a kind of matrix by thinking that this is the maybe row, row variable, and this is the column variable. Right? So the, the order is a little bit strange, may, may look a little bit strange, but uh, anyway, we can do, introduce such matrix like this, or a vertex model. Then the partition function for this vertex model is really like this. So we consider, so this R is representing a weight at each vertex. And the uh, weight for the whole system is just a product of this weight at each uh, vertex for the whole vertices. So now we take a product. And then take a sum of our configuration. So this is the vertex model in general. <coughs> but uh, so this is really a product of all vertices. But maybe we can first consider product here and product here, and so on, right? And then take a product of these, these things. And uh, 
if the weight is kind of homogeneous for all vertices, this can be written as like this. Index of R, index. Uh, so, so these values at each edge are denoted by L, J, L prime K. Uh, sorry? Size of, size of, uh, well, this is not specified yet. For, for six vertex model, we take just, uh, so these values take only zero, one. Uh, th this comes later. For the moment, this is kind of general. <laughs> Yeah, so now we are considering uh, product here, here, here. And then take already a sum of a possible values of the variables here on this line. And this is represented by a sum of L1, blah, 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 LL. But then we are considering the product of these <coughs> L vertices. And we are again assuming that there is a periodic boundary condition, and the size is L and L prime. So the product is just uh, consisting of, uh, consists of L R's here, right? And then, because of this periodic nature, we are putting L1 here and also here. So this means that we are considering a periodic lattice. And then, so this transfer matrix is uh, kind of already sum of all intermediate vertices here. And then as a next, we consider sum over here. And this can be represented as product of this matrix, matrix T. And because there are L prime, uh, the side is L prime in this direction, we take the power to the L prime. And because of this periodic nature in this direction, we finally take a trace of this matrix. Right? So this is a huge matrix, depending on and the element is denoted, uh, is specified by all of these values, right? Is it okay? So this is the general vertex model, and uh, this is the, uh, yeah. So this T is called a transfer matrix. Because in a sense, this transfers the, the situation here to the situation here, and so on. So, uh, and uh, of course, the T can be, yeah, as you can see here, T can be represented graphically uh, like this. And then the periodic city be written like this. So this is the transfer, the graphical representation of the transfer matrix here. Okay. And then, yeah. For this vertex model, again, we are of course interested in calculating this free energy or unit volume. Then, <clears throat> then we consider L and L prime goes to infinity limit. And then, so if, you, if one can diagonalize this transfer matrix T, then of course this should become lambda one to the power L, maybe lambda max, and so on, oh, sorry, L prime. So lambda max is the largest eigenvalue of this huge transfer matrix, right? And if we can calculate the largest eigenvalue of this transfer matrix, then this, uh, this gives us the leading order when L prime goes to infinity. And then at least, so this division by L prime uh, disappears. And basically we are interested in only log of lambda max. And the question is whether we can really calculate this lambda max and also other eigenvalues. 
Yeah. But this is in general difficult, well, Im almost impossible. But in certain cases, yes. Sorry, I, I, I can't hear you. Ah, no, no. Uh, of course, uh, lambda max depends also on L. And uh, then this should behave like something to the power L. And uh, this is an expected behavior for lambda max. And then we can consider this. But this comes, yeah. This comes later. later. Well, maybe it doesn't come, but yeah, this is the situation, yeah. Okay. So this is a very, very general vertex model, of which we don't know basically usually what to do. <laughs> this is a formalism, but we, we cannot really proceed from here. But uh, there's a very special case of vertex model for which this, this can, for, for example, this lambda max can be calculated exactly. So the most well-known case is the famous six vertex model. And uh, yeah, uh, as, as, as he asked, I haven't specified what kind of values these variables can take. But uh, for the six vertex model, we consider the, the situation in which these values can take only two possible values, you know, denoted by zero and one. Right? And uh, then there are, we consider the case like, like this, zero, 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 zero. And so on, and we could put also one. And zero is represented by thin line, and one is represented by thick line. So, and so on. So in principle, there are two to the power for 16 cases, right? For, for the case where uh, yeah, these values can take zero and one. But uh, for the sixth vertex model, we we consider a situation in which only six, there are only six non-zero ways. Other, other configurations gives us weight zero. So let me write down the six ways, the six cases. So we only, yeah, okay, so first let me like draw them down. So we consider only these six cases. So this has, so in a sense we can consider, yeah, as I, as I mentioned a little bit, we can consider this as a row and a column, and then maybe we can consider kind of time direction, in this diagram direction, then these six cases conserves the number of thick lines, right? We could, maybe we could consider a case where this one is only thick, but in this case, if we look at it in this way, this, there's one thin line, thick li one thick line, but then the outcome is just a two thin lines. So there's no conservation of thick lines, right? So whereas in these six cases, the number of thin thick lines from this part and this part, they are all conserved. And we only keep this six weight, so this is the six vertex model. And uh, usually, we, when we especially consider zero one symmetry, I think, we put weight, the same weight to these two, and same weight to these two, and same weight to these two. So then, the weight, as a matrix here, so this particular six vertex model is written as yeah. So as, of course, uh, other other places are zero, and there are yeah sixteen possible positions, and only six places are filled with these weights, non-zero weights. A, so this is zero, 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 zero element corresponding to this, so this comes with weight A, and so on. Well, we can think in a different way, but uh, if we look at in this way, the number of thick, thin line, uh, thick lines are conserved. Yeah. 
Uh, th uh, that's right, that's right, yeah. <laughs> It depends on some yeah, uh, purpose. <laughs> yeah, we can sometimes we look at this way, and sometimes we look at this way. If we consider general A, B, C as ways, this is still not exactly not solvable. But uh, when we can parameterize these A, B, Cs in a particular way. If these weights can be written, parameterized in this way, so now, now A depends on x over y. In fact, uh, yeah, x over y and y over x appear. So this is a function of x over y. <coughs> and Q is just a parameter, positive, uh, maybe, maybe not really positive. Yeah, so no, no, sorry. For the moment, this is just a parameter. <coughs> and in this case, let's denote this weight as R of x, y. Of course, this can be written as a single variable matrix, x over y, but uh, we could also write it like this. Hmm? X and y are some, some auxiliary parameters to parameterize these weights. Ah, uh, yeah, sorry, yeah. Q is, mm, <laughs> Q is, uh, Q is also a parameter, but, uh, well, let's say. But then, yeah, at this point, these are just three parameters, which parameter as A, B, C in a particular way. But of course, uh, even though we are considering three parameters, yeah, as I said, this, the dependence on X and Y are very special. It, uh, it appears only as X over Y. Basically, we are considering three param two parameter case. Right? So in the original eight, uh, six vertex model, there are three parameters, A, B, C, but now they are parameterized by two. <laughs> okay, but uh, so this is a very, very special case. And this case is known to be exactly solvable. <laughs> and in fact, so this matrix satisfies some nice uh, cubic relations. I'm, which I write down now. Sorry, <laughs> but uh, this is just, just the opposite order from the left-hand side. So this one can check directly. Maybe it uh, could take, oh, yeah, so sorry. Yeah, here I have to explain this one, right? <laughs> so this is, uh, originally this R is a four by four matrix. But this can be considered as acting on <clears throat> uh, tensor space. Depend so you know, when we are labeling the matrix, uh, L, not L, <laughs> these by using two variables. So maybe we can consider two, cons two spaces, spaces, two dimensional spaces corresponding to the first first one and the second one. And then, now we consider maybe, so R is, a, we consider as, so suppose, we are considering the case of two dimensional vector space, and R can be considered as a matrix in this space, right? 
But then R12 means that uh, this is R times 1, 3. So this, so this is a matrix on three, three tensor, tensor product spaces, the same. And uh, <coughs> so four by four matrix acts non-trivially only on the first spaces, also on the second one, and acts on the third space as a uh, unit matrix. So one, three means that uh, one, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry. Uh, uh, yes. Anyway, so this is a unit matrix on the third space. Is it okay? So, so this is a kind of standard tensor notation. Is the meaning clear? Yeah, sorry, yeah, that, maybe that's better. <laughs> yeah, so this is a uh, oh, no. Okay. Then, the, similarly, 1, 3 means that uh, this 4 by 4 matrix R acts non trivially as a matrix R on the space of first one and the third one. And similarly for the, the 3 case. In total, basically, this is an equation for 8 by 8 matrix. Right? <coughs> for example, by using Mathematica, one can check that this is satisfied. So this is the famous Jan Baxter equation. Which, which ensures the kind of exact solvability of the model we are considering. And this Jan Baxter equation can be represented graphically like this. So we are considering maybe trajectory of three particles in this direction. And then first we have a collision of second and the third particle denoted by R23. Then comes the collision of one and three, right? Then comes one, two. So this corresponds to the left-hand side. And similarly, in this case, first R1, two here, R1, three here, and R2, three here. And in a, in a cert, certain context, this mat matrix R has a meaning of also scattering matrix. And in this sense, this means that uh, even though the order of the scattering are different, they produce the same result as a net result, right? <coughs> and this is the Jan Baxter equation. And this, from this, one can derive various properties of the model, in fact, which I try to explain from now. <coughs> <coughs> First, we introduce some auxiliary object, or in many cases called monodromy matrix. as a product of L R matrices, like this. Here, the mat, the, the, uh, again, we are constant in tensor product space. Zero is auxiliary space. And one, two, blah, 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 L are the same as before. This corresponds to kind of physical space corresponding to L side. But uh, we also consider some auxiliary space denoted by zero here. Is it okay? Do you see the meaning of this? Xi's hmm? are also auxiliary uh, parameters, which is, uh, yeah. We could also put the dependence on Xi. Yeah, but uh, yeah. In, uh, 
three theme in our main discussions in this lecture, we put all of them to be one. So yeah, I'm omitting the dependence on psi i's. So the main dependence on is on theta here. <coughs> Yeah, 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 thank you, yeah, that's something I want to write it down now. So the transfer, mat uh, sorry, monotony matrix maybe here, is represented as Monotropy matrix is represented in this way. <coughs> so this is R matrix, R matrix, there are L R matrices, which are taken to be product in this way. But in the case of tr transfer matrix, this L prime was taken to be the same, and also the sum of L was taken. But uh, for, the, for this monotropy matrix, we keep them to be undetermined. We make it, yeah, yes? Auxiliary space is here. Mm -hmm. Eight, yeah, four by four, all four by four, originally. Oh, just four by four. Four by four, yeah. But uh, as well, in that sense, uh, in total, this is uh, 2 to the L plus 1 times 2 to the power L plus 1. So this acts on V, this acts on V, so there are L. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, you, we could put uh, maybe J1, blah, 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 J, yeah. So corresponding to this picture, we could put the uh, matrix elements J1, blah, blah, J, L. K1, blah, 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 KL. And in addition, we could put L and L prime here. And uh, we could write this as a two by two matrix, only by considering only L and L prime. Okay. And A, B, C, Ds are 2 to the power L times 2 to the power L matrices. Okay. So if we, we specify these values, L and L prime, to be either 0 or 1, then we can, so, you know, indices for the matrices are this and this. So it corresponds to the fact that we are considering now 2 to the power L times 2 to the power L matrix. But we can specify L and L prime to be either 0 or 1. So they can be represented as 2 by 2 matrix. Uh, yeah, this is here. Theta is here, and Xi one, Xi two is here. What is that? What are Indices are K one, K two, and the parameters are for each R matrix. There are only two parameters, right? X and Y. So in a sense, Xi one is this way, and Theta is this way. Yeah, so, so if you're not familiar with this kind of notation, this may be a little bit confusing, but uh, yeah, once you, yeah, you, you just, I think, uh, just, you just have to get used to it. After a while, then this, this is not at all difficult. Right, okay. Then, so, 
we were interested in diagonalization of this transfer matrix, right? but we introduced this monodromy matrix. But uh, they are related by very simple relation, right? <coughs> so in fact, transfer matrix is just a trace of this monodromy matrix. And in this notation, these are just A plus T. And pictorially, in the graphical representation, yeah, if we take L and L prime to be the same, and take L equals zero, uh, take a sum over L equals zero and one, then this becomes exactly the same as the transfer matrix here. And so this is, as a formula, it is written like this. Right. So by considering some properties of the monodromy matrix, maybe we can study transfer matrix. That's what we do as a next step. From the young baxter equation, equation, one can show for this monodromy matrix the following relation. So we now prepare two spaces, one and two, and then consider this particular product. Then this relation holds. And this is sometimes called fundamental commutation relation. Commutation, yeah, let's see. And in fact, so, this fundamental commutation relation can be checked graphically rather easily by considering uh, that formula using these figures. So uh, monodromy matrix is like this. Another monodromy matrix like this, like this. So we consider T1 and T2, and we put R matrix. Then the, what the Jan-Baxter equation tells, tells us is that uh, when we have some crossing like this, this can be exchanged without changing uh, the result. So now this can be represented like this. And this procedure can be done many time, times recursively. Then finally what we get is the the situation in which the crossing appears at the, at the right-hand side. This corresponds to the right-hand side of this fundamental commutation relation. Of course, one can try to calculate this, to check this, but graphically it is easier to see by using the Ambax equation. And once we have this relation, then basically by multiplying R inverse here, we have R E T are inverse of T, right? Then we can also take a trace, then this disappears, and then from this you get very important fact about a transfer matrix, that in fact, for two different values of psi and theta for the transfer matrix, they just commute, right? <clears throat> So this is uh, basically, as you as you can see, that this commutation relation for two different values of the transfer matrix is a simple consequence of this Yambaxa equation. Once we can find vertex model which satisfies this Yambaxa equation, then by this standard machinery, one can find transfer matrix which commutes for different values, and from here one can find commuting operators very very easily. Uh, yes, we are considering kind of two spaces, one and two. Yes, 
space there are actually, so now, in a sense, that we are considering two auxiliary spaces. Yeah. yeah, first and second one. And uh, this axon is two auxiliary spaces. Yeah. Three. There are no three here. So, so you are talking about the physical space, right? Yeah. No, no, the physical space is kind of implicit here. We are now... Uh, <laughs> uh, Ah, that's right, yeah, in that sense, yes, yeah, that's right, yeah. <laughs> yeah, then you, I think it's better to write it down, uh, the formula. Then you do see how we use this. Mm. Yes? It should be the same, yes? Yeah. Yes? Okay. And then, now we want to see some commuting operators. And this is also very easy. So we expand this uh, transfer matrix around theta equal 1. Then we can expand it like this. Uh, yes. And then for the case where, yeah, I, I equal one, in this case, then, oh uh, yeah. And by plugging this expansion into this commutation relation for transfer matrix, one can easily see that uh, these IN, so these are also, big matrices of size 2 to the power L, so they just commute, right? For arbitrary N and M. And first few forms of the quantities are kind of important. The first one is kind of a little bit simple one. Maybe I denote it by the As a first one, we get a shift operator. because we are considering translation invariant system. As the next conserve the quantity for this six vertex model, what we get is Some matrix denoted in this way, and uh, here, sigma x, sigma y, sigma z, so they are Pauli matrices. They are also given in the nodes, so if you don't know, you can take a look, you can check. And this j, again, means a tensor product notation. Now we are considering L tensor spaces, and this j means that uh, this two by two matrix, Pauli matrix, acts non-trivially only on the space related to the site J. For other sp spaces, this just acts as a unit matrix again. Anyway, so this is the... Hmm? Delta, delta, you mean? Yeah, so this is the expansion, so these are coefficients, so there's no dependence on theta. Yeah. Okay? Okay. <laughs> and delta, is uh, yeah. So this is the kind of famous <coughs> XXZ spin chain. So and uh, because XXZ spin chain appears as an expansion from this six vertex transfer matrix, in fact, uh, this six vertex model and XXZ spin chain have the same eigenstate. Anyway, and the delta, so in the context of quantum spin chain, delta should be real. So in that sense, Q is either real or on the, we are considering the case Q is on the torus, e to the power I, I, I gamma or something. 
So uh, one a small remark is that in fact uh, I1 contains some constant factor and some additive constant, but uh, here I, I am just omitting them for simplicity. So yeah, as I already mentioned, in particular we have this relation. So x x t spin chain Hamiltonian has uh, co sorry. So again is a conserved quantity for the dynamics described by this x x t spin chain. So this kind of relation already appears in the talk by Herbert on Monday. So in this sense, yeah, in the classical limit, this becomes a Poisson bracket, and uh, this is basically the, what is that? The, uh, the integrability in the Liouville sense. In the quantum case, this is not completely uh, assuring the integra integrability, but uh, this is uh, at least some mani manifestation that uh, there, sh there should be something one can do. Uh, by using this machinery. Okay. Okay. Almost. I, uh, it's not <laughs> okay. It's not working. <laughs> okay. Then next, I want to explain a little bit about how one can find eigenvalue and eigenvectors for the transfer matrix, and at the same time, the x axis spin chain by using the standard machinery. Of quantum integral system called algebraic beta ansatz. Only briefly, of course. And, uh, I, I, I gave a few references. The first one was I gave. This, this is a. There are already a few books and many uh, review papers. On, on, by which you can learn about algebraic beta. There are many, many things, but uh, at least for me, so, so I first learned this algebraic beta by reading rather short review by Fadev from 94. And uh, so this is not really about uh, XXX or, uh, XXXZ or spin chain, but this is, at, at least for the beginning, he explains in a very simple way for the case of XXX. XXX means that Delta equal one case, which is kind of simpler. Uh, yeah, he explains this algebraic beta as for this simple, simplest kind of simplest case, and this was very useful. So, if you want to know a little bit more, maybe what you can start from here. And there are other books like Bogolyubov, uh, Izergin, Korepin, or there are several books. But anyway, <laughs> so. In the quantum context, we want to find eigenfunction and eigenvalues, as in the case of ACEP. And then, first, we want, maybe we can try to find some single eigenvector for this. And there's a simple one, at least for this special case. If we consider, so yeah, okay. Here I'm, I just use, uh, you know, uh, Dirac notation for vector. I hope it's okay for you. So now we are considering L two-dimensional tensor product spaces, and uh, e on each space, uh, states are labeled by zero and one. And as a very very particular case, we can consider the state in which all states are zero. And this we call the pseudo vacuum. And one can easily check by the definition that uh, this is in fact uh, eigenvector for this transfer matrix with eigenvalue. So this is eigenvalue vector with eigenvalue and this eigenvalues is very also sim simply calculated to be a a theta which appears here, right? To the power L plus d, d of theta to the power L. And then, then a general eigenstate can be also constructed by using this scheme. Now we use this B matrix.
we consider some vector in this form. Yeah, this I cannot explain here today, but uh, after somewhat lengthy calculation, I think, one can check that this gives us the eigenvector, in fact, with the eigenvalue. And the eigenvalue can be calculated to be given by this expression, where f is given by ratio of a over p, a and b. <clears throat> and uh, the fact that this uh, gives us the eigenvector can be checked by using uh, uh, the fundamental commutation relation from fcr. I don't really give the proof. But the, the thing we have to use to show that this is the eigenvector is, for example, one can show that B with different var parameter values, they simply commute. So it does, not depend, depend, it does not depend on the order of the product. And in the fundamental commutation relation, some commutation type of relation between A and B or D and B are included. Something similar for D. Then, and the transfer matrix was just uh, sum of A plus D. So when we try to apply transfer matrix to the state like this, then we want to use commutation relation of this type. And then basically, this part gives us the fact that uh, B, product of B, would give us the eigenvector <laughs> with some product of F function appears as an eigenvalue. But uh, there are some extra terms here. And then this gives us some condition for the state as a product of B to be eigenvalue, uh, sorry, eigenvector. And this gives us some conditions on the values of A at theta j's which can be written in this form. Right, so to summarize, so once we have the yang <laughs> once we have R matrix, which satisfies yang baxter equation, then there's a standard machinery to construct uh, eigenvalue and eigenvector for the transfer matrix. And the eigenvector is given in this form as a product of B, uh, B matrices applied to this pseudo vacuum. And then the eigenvalue is also given by this. And there's a condition which should be satisfied by these theta j's. And this is given by this form. Yes? Here? Yeah. This is n. This is related to n particle. We are considering system size tail, and there are n particle cases. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, this is the standard machinery of the algebraic equations. But this is, uh, you know, 
By this uh, standard thing one can do is to study XXT spin chain, right? Not ASAP and so on. Oh, oh, where, where is ASAP? So now we consider stochastic version of the six vertex model. Which was basically introduced by Herbert a long time ago, in 1992. So, again, we consider this kind of six non zero weights, but the weights are now modified a little bit. So, what are the weights now? For well, this case, we put weight one. For well, this case, we also put weight one. For well, this case, we put weight delta one. Uh, this is delta two. This is one minus delta one. This should be one less delta two. Right, so again, the six vertex model, but the weights are somewhat different. So <coughs> now, this R matrix is simply going this way. And the big difference from the previous time is that now this satisfies stochasticity condition. That uh, if you consider the state transition, state change from this, these to these, then if we sum up all the weights, it should become one. Right? All, all elements should be non-negative. And if you sum up in this way, they should give us one. And uh, this is satisfied here. Yes? That's right, yeah. In the usual six vertex model, we put just three parameters, A, B, C. And in this case, we had uh, B, and B, B, and C, C. But uh, for this stochastic six vertex model, such property is not, is not here. Yeah. It's not satisfied. Yeah. So, in, so yeah, because of this stochastic interpretation for this R matrix, even when we consider this transfer matrix, we can consider that the transfer matrix really creates the discrete time Markov dynamics. So we are considering the product of these stochastic 4x4 matrices in this way, and then transfer matrix gives the uh, uh, update of the configuration from this line to this line and so on. And this is stochastic. Right? Now. Yeah, that's fine. Interesting. One can parameterize, we can take slight, somewhat different parameterization of this stochastic six vertex model in this way. Of course, uh, we have to take them appropriately so that they are non negative, but uh, one can consider such restriction. So, in this case, delta, delta functions of Yeah, if you parameterize in this way. So, in a sense, physically, this looks very natural, right? But from the point of view of integral systems, this parameterization is much better. This is what I mean. And again, maybe we can again. Fine. Maybe we can put tilde. So this can be also written as R, which depends on two parameters x and y, with the external parameter small q now. And then now we have some kind of vertex weight like this. One can check that if this satisfies uh, the Young Baxter 
equation which disappeared already. And in fact, so this R matrix, R tilde matrix, also satisfies the Jan-Baxter equation. Then one can really follow the same steps to calculate, uh, to, to, cons to calculate the eigenvalue and the eigenvector. Right? And, uh, <coughs> yes, this is the, so then in this way, one can really study the stochastic six vertex model by using this standard machinery for quantum integral systems. In addition, so what about what happens for the conserved quantities? Maybe I, I just erased. <laughs> For this R tilde matrix, we can consider again the transfer matrix. And the first one is again uh, kind of shift, but, uh, okay. And then what about the first term here? So in the case of the standard six vertex model, this was HXXC, XXC spin chain Hamiltonian. But in this case, what we get is in fact a continuous time ASIP, generator of the continuous time ASIP. Uh, yeah. Which it can be written in this way. <clears throat> so this is again the tensor product notation, which acts on only Two spaces, two spaces related to sites J and J prime. And uh, so yeah, this is related to the particle hopping to the right. Uh, yeah, so now I'm taking maybe P equal one uh, normalization, but this corresponds to particle hopping to the right, and this corresponds to particle hopping to the left at the sites between J and J plus one. And the fact that uh, if we sum up in this way, this gives zero. This gives us the stochasticity, stochasticity condition for the continuous time setting. For the discrete time, if you sum up, this should give us one. But in the continuous time, this should give us zero if you take a sum. So this is, uh, and uh, yeah, this is in fact the ASIP. So then, as in the case of the six vertex model and the XX spin chain Hamiltonian, by applying these standard techniques of algebraic beta and that one can construct the uh, eigenstates for the ACIP as well, the generator for the ACIP. Oh, no, this is ACIP, general ACIP, with a normalization P equal one, but this is always possible by this in time. So, so you're you're not saying P plus two. Yeah, that's right, yeah, so I, I changed the normalization by, again, rescaling time a little bit. Yeah, depending on the situation, yeah, normalization. So one normalization is more convenient, so yeah. Right. Yes. Hmm? Yeah, yeah, I understand. Yeah, thank you. But let me make one few remarks. So, uh, so what is the, the connection to what we did yesterday? So yesterday we already studied the ACIP and constructed the eigenfunction with some given eigenvalues. But now I'm saying that uh, with this algebraic beta, and that's one can also uh, create, uh, construct eigenfunction, eigenvalues. But of course, they should be the same. And uh, this is not so trivial, but uh, by taking these parameters appropriately, these values and so on, then one can, in fact, check that uh, this eigenvector gives us exactly the same eigenfunction constructed by coordinate based beta that we used yesterday. So, so this is, in, in a sense, in that sense, this is a kind of algebraic generalization of the beta and that's method. That's why this is called algebraic beta and that's. But in fact, uh, after all, the states we, we get are actually really the same. Even when we use the coordinate beta and that's, or algebraic beta and that's, the net results or the eigenfunctions are the same. In a sense, of course, the coordinate ones are more robust, but uh, for some more sophisticated models, this kind of algebraic scheme is also very, very useful. <clears throat> yeah, I think with this remark, I think this is a good point to stop. Yeah, this, and uh, tomorrow I explain the generalization to a higher spin, and then then comes to about kind of original problem of studying uh, current fluctuations so on for the more general case.
Yeah, like QT save or even higher spin. So, okay, that's all. Thank you for your attention.